Gender and gender identity. Um, this is one where it's becoming more and more important to ask because there are many um, members of our community that now prefer to go by the pronoun of them opposed to he or she. And so, um, case in point, when I did Innovate with Jenny Price a few weeks ago, Fire Belly actually asked, as introduce yourself, what chapter, which pronoun you prefer. And there were some people in the room where it was like, wait, what? <laughs> that makes no sense. But then when you went through and you had some people say, I prefer them, it was like, oh, well, that's new. But for them, it's not. Like, that's who they are. You know. So if you don't know, once again, ask. And in some cases, it's about just being gender neutral and not assuming that someone's you know, being identifying with X, Y, Z. And then, of course, removing gender for any descriptive terms. <sighs> Sexual orientation. So you have, historically, LGBT rights. Then, over time, it became LGBTQ rights. And now it's LGBTQIA rights. A lot of letters, <laughs> OK? But essentially, what they mean is for them trying to be more inclusive and recognizing that, once again, everything's on a spectrum. No, well, I had a, an instructor that said that sexuality is on a spectrum. No one truly can be defined versus X, Y, Z. Um, but L is lesbian, G is gay, B is bisexual, T is transsexual or transgender. Q is questioning. Depending on the generation you talk to, they will say queer. And then I is intersex. And then A is ally or asexual. Um, and then just going with it being an ally, um, I included this because we all can be allies in some, some shape or form. Uh, as I stated, being someone that has not only a bachelor's but a master's degree, I can be an ally to people in my family and within my community that does not have higher education. And you know, you can be an ally as a white person, you can be an ally as a male, you can be an ally as a person that higher up in a social economic status. There's many different forms and fashions of being an ally. And just wanted to just point out, it once again goes with listening. So you see how important listening is? And we lose that element so much. But listening, being open-minded, and then also being an ally is educating others, but then also recognize that you are still learning. And once again, like I stated earlier, you're not, you can't walk in someone's shoes. That, does, that naturally cannot happen. Um, but being empathetic of other people's experiences and you know, just having conversations and organic conversations and authentic ones, not going in and saying, I want to learn this from you, so let me just have this you know, just static, inauthentic conversation just because I want to get X, Y, Z, but actually learning and knowing people based on who they are as individuals. Um, and then the last one I love to state because I feel like we're afraid of this, even though in the design profession we say all the time, make mistakes, fail earlier, make mistakes, prototype, ideate, blah, blah, blah. Um, but it's the same in diversity and inclusion. You're going to make mistakes. That's OK. The world doesn't end. <laughs> it's not over. You may receive some backlash on it. That's OK, too. Um, but learn from it and keep doing your work. No one's perfect. That's just the reality of the situation. And it's all about just constantly educating ourselves and not being, not being moved to the point of inaction. Because sometimes we get to the point where we made mistakes, so I'm not going to do anything with it at all anymore. I'm not, I'm not going to even jump into it because I messed up. It happens. Learn from it. Keep doing your work, because we need to continue to have allies within this space, opposed to people that turn away because they feel that they upset someone. And then just a brief introduction. So these topics I'm going to talk about, I'm not diving deep in at all. Um, it's usually kind of like diversity 102. <laughs> um, but one is impact versus intention, because the intention was this, was to showcase and be the most inclusive possible for a video. But the impact from a person that may be visually impaired or a person that may be deaf is that they were excluded. No one thought about how they would be able to interpret and appreciate the video. Another example of intention versus impact. So this is an ad series that I believe was in Iraq, um, in which it was for a, a mattress series. And the, the concept was that you had this negative thing happen to you in your life. You laid on this beautiful bed. And apparently, this bed made you bounce back into this amazing person. So Steve Jobs got fired. 
you know, the world was going to doom, he popped up and pretty much would be, could be named one of the top innovators of our society, right? So this went successfully well, that's Gandhi. And then they ran this one. What's wrong with that image? Yes. She's getting shot in the face, bounce off the bed, comes up, she wins obviously the prize that, and you know, the recognition that she has now. And once again, intention versus impact. The intention for them, their intention was to show, you know, she's been through this hard time, but she bounced back, she's this positive role model. You know, no matter what we go through in life, we can always bounce back and be this positive figure. Um, but the impact was extremely negative because you have this young girl that was shot and to use that and commercialize that to sell mattresses, <laughs> mattresses mm -hmm. kind of brought, brought this major uproar uh, and negative kind of experience to them. And it's happened in many different cases. We have to take into account how some people may interpret what we're putting out, not how we're interpreting it. And just, and to be clear, while I am a caramel woman, <laughs> okay, I am not gonna represent every caramel woman out there. You know, I'm, as a woman, I'm not gonna represent every woman that's out there. You know, so it's not just putting, bringing, once again, this tokenism that one person at the table, but having many different viewpoints so that they will catch things such as this that comes out and say, no, that, that's not going to work at all. So, you know, just thinking about the impact of whatever you put out and not just the intention of it. Then I wanted to talk about very quickly around privilege because this term, you have two sides, you have some that say yes, it exists, and you have some that say no, it does not exist. And most of the time people hear the term privilege and usually they hear white privilege. But one of the things I always like to say when I do my presentation is privileges come in many shapes and forms. There is white privilege. Whether we want to admit it or not, there's white privilege. But there's also education privilege. There's also gender privilege. There's also sexual orientation privilege. There's privileges in many different shapes and forms. And it's not necessarily a negative. It's just the reality of our society. You have some that receive greater opportunities and access that are unearned based on you know, who they know, how they were born, you know, whatever it may be. That is a form of privilege. Some cases, you can't shed it. And in many cases, why would you want to? Like, I, I, why would you want to shed privilege? To me, you, you should use your privilege to help others and to become an ally and to share that privilege. You know, it's many times like we want to shy away from it, but it's an opportunity to get other people into the door and to help people that don't have access and don't have this opportunity. So, you know, for me, I always thinking about designer, how is this depicted in the design industry? And to be honest, design is very Eurocentric. <laughs> That's just, you think? just saying. You know, you have this very specific design aesthetic that is being recognized and appreciated and other ones are not being recognized. You know, we even have books that's good design versus bad design. Well, depends on the eye of the beholder, because while you, while you may not agree with that church flyer, it may be more productive than that beautifully designed poster that you have hanging up on this wall that no one can understand. So is that a form of good design or is that a form of bad design? You know, and just recognizing that in our design industry, we need to be more open to different types of practitioners, different types of design, and recognize that there's privilege in that form as well.